Schumann's album for the young was composed for his three daughters. This piece, the first one that we're going over today in particular, was written for his daughter Marie on her birthday. These pieces are beautiful, delicate pieces that he wrote for beginners, um, but they really do vary in difficulty from piece to piece. So some are a little bit more difficult. Some are really great for beginners. This one in particular is a good one for a beginner. It's got beautiful phrasing, beautiful voicing. It develops your skills, but it also really shows you the depth and richness of the music of one of the Romantic era's greatest composers. I'll play the piece for you and you can hear it. Kind of get a picture in your head for how it should go. Then we'll talk about the things that you want to develop, think about while you're practicing it, and things you want to avoid to make sure you can do it very well. First, I want to talk about the phrasing for this piece and the form of it, okay? Get the overall picture first. This piece is in rounded binary form, meaning it's a two-part form, A and B. Each one is repeated, so it's A, A, B, B. The A section is just the first four bars. It has a repeat sign, so you can clearly tell that's the A section. It has two phrases, and each phrase is two measures long. So it's pretty short phrases, but it all works together. That's the first phrase. And then the second phrase, which moves away from our home key of C. That's a pretty typical feature of binary form. The B section starts in measure five and goes all the way to the end. It looks much, much longer, but part of that is simply because the repeat sign is not there. So the repeat is just, everything is written out twice. It is longer though. You have a one bar phrase in measure five, another one bar phrase in measure six, and then a two bar phrase measures seven and eight. One plus one plus two. This is common um, phrasing. It's kind of a way of building or stepping up. So the first one, the second one, and the third one. So you can hear each one is showing us that we're moving somewhere until we get to the third one. The third one is different, right? If the third one wasn't different, we wouldn't feel like we had arrived. We would feel like we're still trying to go somewhere. So that's why it's longer. And that's why it comes back down. And it brings us back around to measure nine. Which again, just like the beginning, except the next part is different because we can't end it away from the home key. We have to return back to C. Right, because that's how we're gonna end the piece. That's why this is called rounded binary is because we have material from the A section that returns to round out the overall form. The important thing when phrasing this is the wrist motion. So let's just go through some of the important motions that we're gonna need. The beginning with your right hand. That's all moving down. So you're gonna bring your wrist up. You're gonna start low and then bring it up. That's what I mean by bring it up. And you come around and over. It's an arc motion like this. Then we're coming up in terms of the music, which is in terms of the keyboard, that's to the right, right? Musically it's up, keyboard it's right. So you're going to bring this one up and then back over to the left for the last note. You always want the last note to be softer than everything else. There's kind of a taper at the end of each phrase. In order to do that, you have to start raising your wrist as you're playing the last note. And it's that raising of a wrist that actually brings your finger off the key. You're not lifting your finger itself, in this case your thumb, but rather it's like you're gently pulling it off with your wrist, as if your wrist has a rope tied to your finger and it just lifts it off the key. The next phrase is very similar to the first one. As you can see, that arc motion continues all the way down. Your left hand is a little bit different. Because of this constant returning to the G in that first measure, there's a little bit of rocking with your wrist like this. I would stop here and then from this next C, you have three notes that all move up. So you want 
a similar wrist motion where you start low and you pick it up and arc over and to the right. And then the next one, you kind of dig into this fourth finger and then bring it around and up with your thumb. And then you have three more notes, right? From the end of measure one, you have three different motions. C, E, F, D, G, F, E, F, E, D. And then the next two measures are gonna be pretty similar. So just kind of the same idea with the rocking. All kind of moving to this direction. We're gonna skip ahead now to measure seven and eight. It starts the same as kind of the beginning with this arc going up and over. Here, again, same as the beginning, but when you come down to this double stop, you have to bring your thumb over a little bit. And while this finger is kind of anchored into that F, you also have to keep your wrist moving. A lot of people lock their wrist when they get to a spot like this and start using their fingers. And that sounds way too clunky. So make sure that you can get comfortable with whatever finger you're using there, whether it's your fifth finger or your fourth finger, that you're able to be still mobile, right? You can practice something like this, right? Where see how flexible you can be with your wrist while that finger is still down. And then, you know, can you play these notes at the end? by using your wrist, not your fingers. The only other spot I really want to cover is the left hand in measure five. Right, it's that little, we call that a lower neighbor when we're just barely going down away from the harmony and then right back up. So you wanna make sure that your wrist is in this case, moving a bit forward and a bit to the left and a little bit up because we're moving from a white key to a black key. So the black keys are on a higher plane. So your wrist kind of wants to move up a little bit. When you come back to the G, you want it to be lifting up. But again, you're coming from this higher plane. So you have to also bring it down a little bit. So instead, I would think about pulling your wrist uh, this direction a little bit. So that's kind of back towards you, but also to the right. That's a little bit more natural, right? Rather than trying to go up, my thumb can't even play it, or going straight down, because that will give my thumb a really heavy feel. So it's rather I'm pulling it out this way. The next thing I want to cover is balance and voicing. Balance means kind of which lines are going to be louder and which ones are softer. In this case, the melody is clearly in the right hand, so you wanna make sure the right hand is much louder than the left hand, right, in, in terms of dynamics. Everything's written as piano, but you wanna think of the right hand as though it's at least mezzo piano, maybe even mezzo forte, so your left hand is underneath it. You hear the difference? If I try to play them evenly, it's more it kind of gets hard to really hear what's going on. There's a lot happening, and it's always important to showcase for your listener what's the important part. In this case, you can even sing it. That's what we want them to hear. The left hand, you have to hear it, but we want you to feel it more than you hear it. Right, it's, it's background. So make sure you practice your left hand by itself. Really light. Your right hand, even though it's piano, everything, you don't want to think loud, but you do want to think full. You want to think that you are singing. You would sing while you play. Breathe and dig into the key. Sink deeply into the key. You're trying to get all the way to the bottom. Right, 
and then when you start putting them together, be slow. You can go note at a time, right? Make sure. that you're never bringing your left hand out and sticking out in any places. You wanna record yourself too and listen back and t you can tell, oh, this note was really sticking out and that will help you to figure out where you need to fix it. Another way to practice is to omit some of the notes in the left hand. There are some stray notes. A lot of times it returns to that G. So if you just remove that, you will end up with this. That's a good way to practice, especially when it's when you're trying to work on that balance, because um, those are the notes that are being played together. You don't need to worry too much about that G. And then you can add it back in later once you're ready. The next part is the right hand itself. You have a couple spots where there's more than one note in the right hand. The first one happens at the end of measure four. Right, and then you can look ahead, the end of measure eight. And then the beginning of measure nine, and it happens later too. In each of these cases, the top note is the melody, and the bottom note is usually a supporting note to fill out the harmony a little bit, because the left hand doesn't quite complete the harmony. And in the case of measure eight, you have another little response, kind of an extra melody, just for a few notes. So that one you want to bring out a little bit. We want to make sure we can hear that. But in all the other cases, it's just supporting notes. This is a lot more challenging than playing your left hand quietly. So here's a couple of tips for that. One, I can play, this is measure four, I, that A and F sharp, I can play the top note by itself as a mezzo forte, and then while I'm playing it, I can add in that F sharp really soft. So I'm training my fingers to be at different volume levels, but kind of separating them out a little bit while also connecting them. This is a good way to start and ease into that feeling of two fingers together. The other important thing when you do start putting them together at the same time, one thing you can use your left hand to play it because it's easier and just so you can get the sound in your ear of what you're aiming for. The other thing is you have your center of balance here, which can be really centered between the two notes but you wanna shift everything a little bit over to the right. Right, you can see how I'm leaning that way rather than just playing them together like this. Now, if we look at measure eight, we have the same thing with F and A. So once again, you can practice the top note and then add the bottom note. You really want to practice that one moment because once you've gotten the balance right, it'll be a lot easier to do the next two notes and put them in the right context. The fourth note is interesting because it's actually a part of the top line as well. So it has to be softer than the top note because it's the last note of the phrase, you wanna taper it. But if it's too soft, it will sound like it belongs to the bottom line and not the top line. Right. It almost sounds like the melody just stopped on the F. But there's one more note, so that you have to find the right balance. You can hear that there. It sounds like it belongs with that melody. So in that case, I would just practice playing the F and the D by itself until you find exactly how you want it to sound. Once again, record yourself playing this. Listen back. Recording is a really good tool. You should make use of technology and you can tell what you want to change and tweak. A lot of times while we're practicing, so much brain power goes into what we're doing that we don't actually have the capacity to listen to ourselves. Next, I wanna talk about coordinating the hands together. So this is more of the technical side of, of things, how to do a lot of this. 
Putting the hands together is a challenge and oftentimes the most difficult places are where your hands are moving in opposite directions. The beginning is not too hard. It's kind of all moving down. Once you get to measure two, there's a lot going on. So you have to map it out. Where are we going together? Where are we going to separate? They're both going out, both going in, out, and together. Out, in, out, together. Right, and again, every time I go in, I'm really thinking about my wrist motion. I'm not so much thinking about my fingers. So you can even map this out without playing anything. You can imagine you're playing and just go out, in, out, together, like that. Practice this in small groups. Right, two notes. Of two or three notes. I usually like to group things together in terms of the direction they're heading. For example, one group, another group, right? My right hand is going down, my left hand is going up, out, in, out, like I mentioned before. The last thing I want to talk about is some fingering challenges you might have. We're going to look at measure 8 and then measure 11. So measure 8. You want to, you know, land somewhere where you can play that without too much trouble. So one way you can do this is you can land on your fourth finger here, right? So it's just five, four, three, two, one, and then you can switch to four so that you're ready to go with your fourth finger here. And then you have one, two, one, and then two. You can also play four and then switch to your fifth finger as you're playing the two. And then you have your third finger here. The last thing you could do is you could play one, three, two, four, and then bring your fifth finger under your fourth finger. And then you can either use your two, that's what I would recommend. You could bring your third finger down, but you have to travel quite a bit to get there. So I don't like that as much. I would do one, five, two. For measure 11, there's also a few ways you can handle this. You can do five, four, bring your fifth finger under, one and five, two and four. That's the one that I prefer. It's a little easier when you have large hands. For smaller hands, it might be harder. Another thing you can do is you can start with your fourth finger and then just bring your fifth finger under right away. Then you land on one and four. And then you can either do two and three or you can just pick up your thumb briefly, which is not too much of an issue because you are connecting the top note. However you want to do it, you want to make sure that these two groups of notes, you lean into the B and F and you lean off on the C and E. You have this nice tension in the music and you want to resolve that. Last thing you can do is five, four, three, and one, and then switch to your fifth finger or switch to your fourth finger. To summarize, I showed you the form of the piece, how to sing and phrase and how to coordinate the hands together. So if you have any questions about this or about anything else, feel free to comment and we always like to answer your questions and hear from you. Happy practicing.